Greetings. Welcome back to the Normal to Nomad podcast, where we are slightly less nomadic. Thank you for pointing it out. <laughs> well, people say, normal to nomad, back to normal. Yeah. But, I don't I, know. I, I wish that this was normal. No, you don't. Well, no, I wish that this was more common. Oh, I see. But. Yeah, we don't really feel like what we're doing is normal. And we have kind of talked about the normal to nomad title i feel like the ethos of being a nomad is challenging the norms is going outside of what's traditional and we still definitely do that we just aren't literally nomadic yeah being like minimal and frugal and all of those things and i think we are still that i can't figure out where to put my mic so i'm not breathing in it i know we are in a new location as you can see yeah we're in our house which is slightly finished it's finished enough for us to live in it through the winter and pressure has been limited or off it's felt so good to just chill because we've been going so hard all for a long time and then last winter it felt like we could kind of chill but we had the whole house looming in the background so it didn't really feel good to be chilling but we're kind of just trying to figure out where our mics go and how we are how we're how we're doing this in our house yeah more space than in the office where we recorded it for the last season, if you will. But I think this will be nice. It'll be kind of fun to film in different areas of the house, even potentially we'll see. as we finish them. Yeah. And we're kind of bringing this back because of my book, Normal to Nomad. We're bringing this back kind of uh, at least the first however many episodes while we're back at it will be an audio version of the book so we'll just go through read each chapter together elsa and i and then have like a director's cut afterward and that way i feel like that's just the best way to publish an audio book that's not like on amazon or whatever and why don't you want to do it through audible through amazon uh i don't know i just don't like how they gatekeep the whole audio book industry and spotify now is doing audiobooks yeah that's an option like i but honestly i want it to be free Mm -hmm. and if people like it and want to follow along you can buy the digital copy of the book worldwide or if you live in the states you can buy a paperback copy and you want to talk about how much uh (laughs) how much trouble the book physical copy situation the, and everything that people have dealt with also. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for everybody that pre-ordered the book. The printer, um, I don't know what words to use that wouldn't be defamatory, but um, in my experience, he was a pathological liar. Like he would lie straight to me about things that I knew the truth of. It was fascinating. And I would like catch him in it and be like, look, dude, I don't. Like, it's all good that this is where we're at. I just want you to be clear with me for these next few days so that we can get this delivered and done with. And then he would lie again about just trivial things. He'd say the books were lost in Iowa or... Yeah, and he hadn't printed them yet. So they had been... It had been like eight weeks of him tracking down the books that were lost in Iowa... And turns out none of it, they, he just hadn't printed them yet. So it was wild. That was why anyone who pre ordered got their books at the very tail end of the pre order. Yeah. The limit that we had. Because he had told me, like, I waited to say that the books were coming out until the last minute. It had been two weeks after he told me they would arrive. And I was like, okay, it should be late enough to where if they're lost in transit, they should be coming in. And he didn't end up shipping the books for another, like, four weeks um yeah it gets me fired up just talking about it and so to make up for that error once we did get a small handful of the books he ended up having to send the books several times because he kept not sending as many as he said he was going to to um make up for that he said that he would cover he would send out all of the pre-order books himself Mm-hmm. And he would cover the shipping. He'd do tracking numbers and everything for everyone. Great. Okay. Because we have our system set in place through my sticker account and everything to do 
shipping uh, so that you get a, an email, you get your shipping number and you can track your book or you can track your product, whatever you're ordering, like very normal. He did shipping in these tiny plastic bags and he, nobody had a tracking number. He said they were going to be in padded, um, like insured, send out all the tracking information, everything. He did like hardly even the minimum. And then a lot of the books got lost in transit. And a lot of the, if you got a damaged book, terribly sorry, you can still reach out and let us know. We've replaced anybody who has comment or has uh, reached out to Baron through the Normal to Nomad website or emailed. We've replaced, we've replaced so many books. Like well over a hundred at this point. It's been quite an unfortunate set of events, but uh, I believe that now we're at least through that and now we are on a mission to find a new printer. I mean, the print quality was excellent. Yeah, we're very happy with the book great. itself. Um, and I could have even dealt with the timelines of everything if he would have been upfront about it and just tell me like, Hey, uh, it's going to take four months rather than taking, telling me it's going to take two weeks. Cause then I set an expectation for everybody else. Right. Having been lied to over and over again. So then it looks like I'm being shady and that, that was gross. You would think that it would be hard to live your life that way. You'd think that if this project was bothering him, he would just send all the books and be done with it. But he yeah. just wouldn't do that. And then at the end of it, for all the trouble, he said that he'd pay Baron 10% of the cost that he paid just to make up for all the lost books, all the, or not lost books. Well, I guess there were just some all lost, of the complications. Yeah. Um, he sent Baron a, a check for 5% and now waiting on the other 5%. So this yeah. has been something else but um yeah i just wanted to like tell that story because we haven't talked about it and that's what went down so if for sorry. whatever reason you still haven't re received your pre-order just send me an email and we'll send you out a replacement copy like right now just send me an email with your correct shipping address and whatever confirmation you got and our shipping is in uh there is are we doing cardboard my mom ships them all out in a very uh, a very nice packaging and with a tracking number, it'll arrive to you safe and sound, and it will look like this. Yeah. So thank you so much for everybody that supported us in that. Um, so far, it's been very successful. You've sold almost three thousand books. Like I think like twenty two hundred something like that. Oh wow! Still, that's crazy. It's been really cool. It's been cool to say that I'm married to an author. I think that's a little. My uh, husband is an a author. A little ambitious, but. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, oh, and it's it's only available physically in the U.S. And that's just because the book itself is like uh, twenty dollars plus five, four or five dollars shipping. And if I was going to sell it overseas, I would have to charge like I don't even know how much for extra shipping. And then if things get lost, it just gets so complicated. And we have to deal with customs and all that. It's just a nightmare. So I originally wrote the book to just be an audio book or just be a digital book. And it was only when I realized how few people knew how to open a digital book file that I decided to make it physical too. So it's like, a, I don't know. Initially it was meant to be digital only. So the physical book is just like an extra treat. <laughs> it's so, such a treat um and then now we'll have the audio book to go with it so you'll be able to jump on our podcast and the next after this episode we'll start with the first episode of the book and or the first chapter of the book and then it'll go straight through all the chapters so if you want to listen to just the audio book it'll be available for free i would love for you to purchase a book if you dig it or if you don't dig it you can still buy one um but we'll do a director's cut at the end of each episode. And then that way, if you're like, ah, I don't want to hear the direct, like, I don't want to hear you guys talk about it, whatever. You can just power through the old book and audio. It'll be fun. I think we have so many stories that didn't go into this book from our nomadic lifestyle, our five years on the road. Oh man. Yeah. And now that we're not in it, I feel like we can, tell the stories that we couldn't tell while we were doing it probably. it's true because we <laughs> we would put ourselves at risk to tell some of the some of our secrets it's not as though we were trying to gatekeep the information or the locations but uh there's a lot that we couldn't say 
to that might jeopardize our for our like legal safety and right. our physical safety. Sounds pretty hardcore, man. You better tune in. Hardly. So we're in our house now, and we were talking about kind of everything that it took to get to this point. How are you feeling in general? First, what do you think about living in our new house? Our, the first few days, I've said this a number of times, but it felt like we were in a fancy Airbnb. Honestly, it still does. Yeah, it felt like we were going to have to, like somebody was going to kick us out. or. I keep still thinking that there's a sink in here just because it's a whole house. There must be a kitchen sink. I walk downstairs like with my coffee cup wanting to rinse it out as though we're actually still at an Airbnb. It's been quite extraordinary. I was not anticipating. I knew it would be wonderful. We've been waiting for so long. How's our audio? What are you doing? It's all good. Oh, okay. I'm trying to just set my computer to not sleep real quick. Oh, I see. Okay, you go for it. I'll just talk. I knew it would be amazing, but to actually be in here and lay in bed, wake up, come downstairs. I can cook breakfast for myself without having to give myself a pep talk to go outside and cook breakfast and have cold breakfast by the time I got inside, which has been, I hope, a really good thing for my health too. This morning I made venison steak and eggs and had a hot cup of coffee and I didn't even have to go outside. So there's been um, a lot of stressors like background stress kind of weird stress that I think I never would have thought about living in a normal lifestyle where you have a toilet and you have a sink and you have access to all a refrigerator and an oven you can you have it all of that when you live without it you just get used to operating in a different way that's not exactly easy we got to tote all of our water you know we have to keep all of our water from freezing during the winter um, just various things like that. So for uh, some of those things to be eliminated has felt just wonderful. You know what? You remember when we moved into the scamp, it was kind of a similar story mm-hmm. of a lot of those stressors of like background stressors, yeah, right? traffic, uh, people talk like, uh, t- uh pe- like just people all around you. We were always living in the city or in the suburbs. There's always people driving by all around. The, those kind of background stressors were eliminated when we moved into the scamp, and it was wonderful. But then we took on a whole new way of life that was had its own stress. Right. That was wonderful. And the end goal was always right this right now where we're at and what we're doing. That was always the end goal of our travels. I can't believe, I can't believe it. We actually did it. For sure. In yeah. old journals, I have written down that... It was a bucket list thing to build our own house, not actually thinking that you could even do that. It felt uh, not possible. Yeah. Like the idea of building our own house felt like something that was not something that we were going to be able to do until we had like a house that somebody else had built established. And then we could build like a small vacation house or something. Right. Seems exactly. like more viable than building your living in house. And we've said it before that we searched for years, the whole time we were scamp lifing for the area that we're in that allowed us a little bit more freedom in what we could build. Uh, We found and waited, found the spot that we could do this, but it it almost just fell into place. I don't know. It's It's, just so amazing. I mean, it's fairly serendipitous. Not for lack of trying. Right. Like it was a long time coming and it wasn't because we didn't think about it or plan anything oh do you like our green chairs speaking of our house we like our green chairs these are thrifted we were at a thanksgiving party in town at a friend's vintage antique store and we were sitting in these chairs and somebody pointed out that they were very comfortable and they wanted to buy them and baron said they are comfortable and i want to buy them and i didn't think i mean i love this kind of stuff I love this green. I painted my college bedroom a weird pea green. I love it because it's a full on. Oh, you keep going back. Oh my God. These yeah. are antique, but Baron, we got home and he's like, I want those chairs. And I was like, are you serious? So and we went. Like, yeah. We picked them up in two trips, brought one home, 
went and got the other. And we're Elsa's going to make a couple rings and trade for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope that this girl ends up ends up kind of helping us style our house and find some cool cool pieces. But it seems like based on Instagram and stuff, I haven't put them in a YouTube video quite yet. You, you, by the time you're hearing this, you may have seen them, but people seem to be loving them. Same. I love them. I mean, we sit in them every day, and if we're not sitting in them, the dogs are. <laughs> right. I think I love them because they're so unique. But I have no idea how we're going to match anything else to these chairs. If we got a green couch or something that was like sage. How I think we... everything else is kind of a gray and then lots of plants, and then it'll come together. So these will be our accent chairs. Yeah. All right. Our wood stove is our accent wood stove. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. We got a lot of people asking questions about why we put our wood stove next to so many windows, why we put it on an outside wall. Uh, aren't we losing heat with all these windows? Did people really ask when we put it on an outside wall? Somebody did. They were curious why we didn't put it on the inside wall to gather more heat. Mm. There's too many windows. Like it's a small wall over here is well, what they're saying. And you only use a wood stove for what, four months out of the year? Oh, also people were asking why we have a position the way we do and not facing the entire room. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just to save space. Us? Here? Yeah. Yeah. Like how it's set up is just the most efficient use of space. Well, we don't have a firebox on the front of it, so we can't really see that there's a fire within it. The art, the thing that you look at is are the side panels on it. It's a big rectangle, and both of the sides have these castings of this animal scene. That's quite beautiful. And like you were just saying, before I cut you off, we only have it in use for... Right so many months of the year and we realized when we were building and like starting to spend time in here as we were building the house that where we're sitting right now is kind of the nicest spot in the morning because the sun from the east comes blasting in so when you're down here stoking the stove in the morning it's really nice to have that eastern sun warming you up and it's just a nice spot to sit in the sun in the morning the design of the home that i think Maybe people who are only tuning in lately don't realize is it's a passive solar design. So we have all these windows to, um, with the, it's James and Doreen's design. We have all these windows to heat the floor and heat the concrete walls. Those will store the heat and then release that at night. And in the summer, if, if it gets too hot, you just open up any of these millions of windows, bring some air in and it cools things down. The wood stove also obviously heats the concrete. Yeah, and James was saying that it will take a number of weeks, maybe even months, for all of the heat to permeate through all of the thermal battery that we have, like all the rock. I think that's been true. Yeah. Because it's so nice now that in the morning after the stove's been... Okay, for example, this morning the wind chill was 4 degrees. It felt like four degrees outside is what the weather app said. I came downstairs and didn't even light a fire because And I had maybe put the last log on at midnight or Mm -hmm. so. And it wasn't like we're not burning nice hardwoods. We're burning like (laughs) there were three whole planks of wood unburned in there from last night too. Yeah. And we're burning like all of our scrap wood from our build. Mm -hmm. So it's like blue spruce and just yeah, it's not great burning wood and it's not in big chunks so if we were burning wood that burns a little bit hotter and longer that was in like full rounds then the stove would be able to go for a long time but right now it kind of doesn't well it might be too hot yeah because really it stays what do you think in the 60s even if we don't have the stove low 60s I don't know if it's because I'm having a little bit of anxiety recording a podcast or if I'm just hot because it's temperature hot in here, (laughs) but it is very, it's very warm. We were a little worried about the low E glass, not allowing enough heat to come in through the Mm -hmm. sun. Still, uh, that's still a concern. Is it? Isn't that funny that they make it like next to illegal to sell windows that aren't low E? Because low E means like high efficiency, low energy input, because you don't have to run your AC as much. Well, that makes sense if that's the system. Not if you're in any part of the U.S. that either one doesn't have AC or two runs heat more than you do AC. That's true. Because it blocks out UV. So then it doesn't let, 
like the windows don't charge up the concrete as much as they could. It's, I don't know, that kind of stuff's kind of obnoxious, but I understand the idea. Mm -hmm. And if you're building a traditional home, traditional stick frame anyway, you can make sense of those rules. There's a lot of rules, though, that we couldn't make sense of. Well, you can make sense of them if you're not, because a lot of rules are in place to make it illegal or next to impossible to build a house that's non-traditional or that, like, observes the where the sun is in the sky or makes use of um, alternative heating methods or cooling methods like all of these things with codes to normalize everything to look like a suburb and feel like a suburb and keep property values up i also think it's to manage the mass populations of people in cities just to have blanket rules to cover so that right. Like in Colorado, there's lots of state rules that don't make sense where we live. And the county rules kind of conflict with the state rules. But the state rules supersede the county. It's annoying. Um, yeah, that these were all things that were something to figure out as we've, as we've gone through this. I don't know how you learn these things prior to. We just had to learn them as we kind of did them. Well, yeah, I don't know. But... I feel like I'm complaining. I don't mean to complain. I, I just, don't think you're complaining. That kind of stuff just really um, frustrates me. Quite a me pain in the ass. I feel like it's really limiting. Like it makes it really hard for people to get a footing without tons of money or a giant loan from the bank, which I don't, I don't know. I wish that we could make it easier on people and not write laws. Like why not address individual issues rather than writing some blanket law because you had one dummy doing something belligerent. I think it's because you're covering so many people. Yeah. I really think that that's the root of it is how do you, it, yeah, anyway. One more thought. I think okay. laws should have sunsetting periods where mm. if a law has been in existence for X amount of time, you should have to like vote or reconsider it after a certain mm. amount of time or it's like phased out because I think we have so much bloat in our legal system that it really hampers everything i think that could go for people as well how do you mean you can only be within a system or within a chair of an office for only so long yeah before you have to try again put your application in again do something else yeah okay this is a whole anyway this is this is a necessary podcast for (laughs) later We have a lot of things to talk about. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of things. Uh, We just, oh my gosh. Okay, we don't quite have running water, but it is kind of for the first time in seven years. It runs. It's got. It's got a, it's a hose. We have a garden hose with a spigot. You just have to have it plugged in. Yeah, a lot of people, I think, will kind of balk at this idea. But we went with a like kind of RV style on demand water pump rather than a pressure tank because it's pretty simple and it takes up no space. And for our usage, having just like a bathroom sink, a shower, and a kitchen sink, we don't need a lot of draw from it. And we're used to using next to no water. So clicking it on and off, like we're not going to atrophy the pump super quickly or not atrophy it, but put excessive load on it. So. I think for our use, that simple system makes a lot of sense. For someone who lives in an apartment and has never had a water tank of any kind, what would be the alternative to what we're doing? So in a lot of, well, okay, so there's like a few different pluses and minuses to either, either way. If you have a pressure tank, like a water pressure tank, then your pump turns on for a certain amount of time to fill up and pressurize the tank. Let's say it's 10 gallons. Once, you, once that 10 gallons of pressurized water it runs out or the pressure depletes a certain amount, then the pump will have to kick back on and fill it again. So what that does is it limits the amount of times that your pump has to kick on and off, which helps it not degrade as fast. So if we were, for example, close enough to our well to where our well pump was our primary like house pump, so that every time our like theoretical pressure tank needed to be filled up, the well pump would kick on and pressurize the tank, 
we don't want to put that much like intermittent load like on and off on and off on our well pump so in that case a big pressure tank would make a lot of sense whereas in our situation we have a simple water system and we have a cistern it's like 600 gallons buried under our foundation so all the water pump does is pull from there and then pressurize all of our tubes to each of our um, faucets and shower so it's pretty simple and again, for anyone who doesn't remember, why are we so far away from our well? When we drilled our well, we drilled it based on where the guy that surveyed it, like where he thought on our land would be the highest likelihood to hit water. And our well is phenomenal. Like we got awesome water, but it's like 600 yards down the hill. So right now we just have like an irrigation line running above ground all the way up here and there's lots of like variation in the terrain and it's all solid rock right so um yeah it'd be really hard to bury so at this point what we're doing is when we fill the cistern we fill the cistern and then i walk down and like lift the pipe above my head all the way down to push all the water out of the pipe because if there's no water in it then it can't freeze so then right now it's just frozen air in there until we need to turn it back on and then we use it and then clear the line again. What is frozen air? Okay, here we are. We had to adjust some lighting. Uh, so we just bought a water heater because yes. temporarily Baron is really eager to install a temporary shower, which would be fabulous. Yeah, because eventually we want to like build our shower tiled and nice and all that but we have a friend that has a thrift store in town and she another somehow, friend with another yeah, thrift store she somehow accumulated a bunch of i don't know what you call it like a shower frame shower basin like a stand-up shower just like the fiberglass um molding of a shower and we have our drains and everything set up so we could just like set that on top of the drain effectively and then we have a We'd shower have to have the shower curtain, which is the bane of your existence outside of ranch and mayonnaise. Yeah. Ranch, mayonnaise, shower curtains, about all that bothers me. <laughs> My mess. Yeah. Clutter isn't, I guess, another thing. Okay. I think that's anyway, all, uh, we're doing a tankless water heater. Why is that? Well, um, again, a lot of it is to save space because we don't have a ton of like utility room space in here. So with a tankless water heater... And it's an indoor installed tankless water heater. And that's another kind of caveat. I know this, this stuff's probably like pretty boring for a lot of people. So I'll try to glaze over it. But a lot of, so you have a tankless or a tank water heater is kind of similar to a pressure tank that we were just talking about before we went to break. Um, and in a, uh, a tank water heater, you have like a big water tank where it has like a heating element in there that keeps the water warm in the tank, right? Well, with a tankless system, you just have kind of like a radiator, but it does the opposite of what a radiator does. Rather than cooling what's inside, it makes it warmer. So you run the water through it, and it has a burning element that's propane. They have electric ones, but we're off-grid, so that's probably not. It would be possible, but kind of another layer of complexity, and propane is really efficient at warming things. So it's going to heat up the water that circulates through it, and then you don't have to have a tank. And another like bonus of the tankless water heaters is they don't ever run out of hot water. So it can just keep running and keep making hot water as the pump pushes water through it. Whereas in a tank, you have a certain amount of hot water. Once you run through all the gallons of hot water, then you have to like wait for it to catch back up. I'd say that's not exactly why we want it because we're not going to be able to run forever showers because we have a cistern and a limited amount of water. The inline wa or the tankless water heaters are also more efficient on propane because when you're not using them, they're just off. And then when you kick them on, then they burn and heat up the water as it goes through them. Whereas in a tank, it's keeping all of that water warm for when your demand is. So like in our case... We're not going to shower thrice a day each. So 
we don't need that like hot water all the time. So when we do need it, it can kick on and provide that for us. And then another thing is it's an indoor insulation rather than an outdoor because the outdoor tankless water heaters have a heating element built into them so that they don't freeze. And that heating element is typically electric from what I understand. So that would be a huge draw on our power. So instead, we're going to install it inside and have a vent that um, like vents out the combusted propane rather than having the whole thing out there. And then you wouldn't have to have a vent. But if you do that, then you got to run like insulated lines to the heater because the water that's like going to it can still freeze. And is it an outdoor heater because of the noise? That's part of it. Noise, and then you don't have to vent it. But we have our water systems underground. Yeah, they're right next to the tank. Yeah, they're next to the cistern, like buried under our foundation. So sound won't be a huge issue for us. And we'll put like an insulated uh, door on them so that sound doesn't get through well i think i'm also not at least maybe i'm just naive and maybe i'll want it later but to have any kind of shower and running water if it makes sound okay well and i got like the quietest pump on the market yeah you can really hardly nice hear pump. it it's great and it currently doesn't even have a door on it so it i'm won't so be happy about it it's so fun to plug it in we don't need to because we still have a 35 gallon tank blue tank from some of our friends we're borrowing we fill that up and then take a pitcher fill the pitcher pour that into the Berkey that's how we're still doing it but sometimes I like to still just plug in the water pump plug it in and then use the garden spigot thing to fill the Berkey it's, it's quite a lot cool. of fun just well feels and so fancy <laughs> up to the point where we filled up the cistern we were kind of like in a tough situation with water because we had that um big kind of water tower at the a-frame and -hmm. that was freezing up and then if we kept any water outside it would freeze up so this way we filled up our 600 gallon cistern most of the way so that'll last us like at least most of winter until we get our shower it's pretty amazing we've gotten very good at living off of very little water Mm -hmm. we used to only as we were scamping we only carried around 12 gallons of water. We had two six-gallon jugs, and we that's all the water. That was before Miss Pilot. Yeah. She's a walrus. Yeah, it, but at that time, though, we could just go to the creek and grab water or go to... A, so we, on we, a, like we when we traveled, we didn't even have water on us most of the time. We just filled up whenever we got somewhere just to save the weight. It was pretty fun. It was pretty wild. Cooking is now a lot better now that we can have our dishes inside. It's something to, to, we're always cooking outside, so we're having to protect against rodents and hantavirus in the mouse poop that will inevitably end up on your cooking table outside. Just fighting that constantly. And if you accidentally, you cook dinner, you want to leave the pot outside on the burner to cool off a little bit before putting it down below the table into the plastic bin that could melt if the the pipe or the pan is too hot so we would often sometimes forget about the pan and then mice would inevitably get on it and you'd have to spend your time before cooking your breakfast cleaning the pan really well anyway that doesn't have to happen anymore after seven years of dealing with that strange yeah and just being able to cook inside in like any weather, Not any temperature. Not have to get all bundled up before we go. You don't have to wear or shoes. Like I always, I had to like put on jackets with a bunch of pockets so that I could put all my spices and everything in my coat mm-hmm. to walk outside to cook. Can you grab me a plate? Can yeah. you grab me a spoon? And the scissors and butter and it was just infinite. Yeah. So this is really cool. I've already I bought a little Dutch Dutch oven after uh, being inspired by Linnea. She cooks bread. In her Dutch oven. I got one with no feet for the wood stove. And I made some chili the other night. My first ever batch of chili. I had never made it before. Because we didn't have deer with us. That has been a plentiful uh, food source for us lately. Um, But also it required too many spices to keep in the scamp. So I never made it. We don't have spice space. No space for spice. Now we got spice space, so we're fine. Yeah, it's pretty dope. And the wood stove has a burner on it where you can pull the plates off, and then the 
flame will directly kiss the bottom of your plate. Right now, I have a simmer pot sitting on the stove. I bought clove, cinnamon, what else? Orange Some, peel. Something else. I bought those just so that I could have a permanent simmer pot on the stove. Makes I need it, it now. Real nice. Yeah, it's great. I freaking love it in here. Mm -hmm. It's so cool. So we haven't, it seemed like right before we moved in, Chris and Linnea were here helping us a bunch and we were just making a ton of progress to get us into the house. And now all that progress, well, it hasn't stopped. The progress of getting water in here was big and you figured out a lot of that on your own by researching and stuff and hooking it all up. And But how, what are we doing now? Why are you smiling at me? Because I'm getting another reflection that's like oh. bouncing off three different windows right into my eyeballs. Yeah, we're figuring this we're out. We're just going to not. Yeah. Uh, if you guys can just not worry about that for five minutes until that reflection It just goes makes away. you look brighter. Maybe I'll be darker. I'm over here now. Um, What were you just saying about Lene and... Oh, the, our progress. It we just made a lot of stopped. progress and then it stopped, yeah. Yeah, I w it's kind of... I don't know. I've needed a break for a long time. I feel like I've been pretty strung out on building and it's just it's not just building it's thinking yeah like keeping all of the things that we need to buy and all the lists and each not only like each step but each um block of steps and then all of the internal things to learn within that it's just a lot yeah you get done with one thing and then you have to start a whole new thing. Like right. you learn all about one whole system that you've never known anything about, finish it. You get relatively proficient at it by the time it's over. And then it's like, okay, now yeah. I got to be a total beginner at this whole new thing. Yeah. But by the end of it, you'll be able to build another house. Yeah. You'll know every step. Which yeah, I'm definitely not going to grow and be a house builder, I don't think. Maybe a consultant. Really? I'll be a consultant. Got to build your parents a house across yeah, the street. Yeah, that will do, but that doesn't count. Mm -hmm. It it just, like I was saying at the beginning, it just feels so nice to be able to enjoy all the work that we've put in over the last, I say two years, but we only started last July, July of last year. And then we took a six-month break. Can you believe that? Hmm. We started last July, worked for six months, took six months off, and then... Worked for six more months. Did we months. for real take six months off? Yes. When did we stop? November. And then didn't really get started on insulation again until May. Oh. Because of the weather. Yeah. And we just didn't want to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, we built this house, even taking a lot of breaks in between. And there's so much driving we have to do to go get supplies. And there's so much thinking. And we had a lot going on this year. That I wonder if you... if. Well, like James could probably build this house in a few months. Well, he's a different kind. Of, he's the only person I've ever met that works so hard that he's got to wear a camelback. <laughs> and he has what he calls um, OCBD, obsessive compulsive building disorder. He can't he can't not be building something. It's almost to a fault sometimes. It's like James. Well, it depends on how you measure it, I guess. But he can't. He can't just. Just chill relax. or like enjoy the project that he's on because he's always because he's ideating always got, about new stuff and he's always got like four things going so that if he gets bored with step six in one project he can go to step two and other project and he's just zooming around i want to say we were kind of talking about it in a well we didn't end up talking about it i made a, an instagram post that i was shocked by the reception of it because i hadn't i just hadn't thought of it this being an issue but i had put on the caption, we built our house with our very own hands with no prior experience. And that lit a lot of people up saying that you didn't build that yourselves. You had so much help. You had, I can't believe you didn't, whatever, tag all these people. And first thought was, I didn't think anything of it because everybody knows how much help we had because we share everybody's story, right. whoever helps us. The only reason that anybody knows that we had help is because that's what we show. Yeah, and I love to share everyone's story and film everyone who comes out as like a remember you did this piece of this house it's great but um w there's a lot of comments about all somebody called james the eighth wonder of the world and while that is it's so true he sure is he what he would do is he would come over help baron get started on we were just talking about all the sections like the blocks of the house 
there's whole sections of the this build. He'd come over, predominantly work just with Baron. Um, Baron would figure out all the workings of how we wanted to operate, how we wanted to do it. And then Baron, for the most part, solo or with the help of other people or sometimes me, would complete the task. And James would go home and start working on his own stuff. James is in about 80% of the videos, but he participated in about 20% of the build. And that 20%, this house couldn't happen without his 20% that he put in. James is the reason that this house is here. And it's hard to figure percentage like yeah. that. But yeah, that's just, just a rough to, estimate. Just like, to give you an idea. Cause, and honestly, too, when I'm building and like doing things like that by myself, it's hard for me to film because it's using all of my brain. and Just to do it. Just to do the thing. So, and then also, it's not interesting to show like the ultra redundant work that I'm doing day after day. All the drives you take to the hardware store. Right. All the drives you take over to James's to get lumber, to right. cut things, to get little bits and bobs. The fun parts to show are when James is here because then we're like learning and doing the thing. And I feel like it's a great opportunity for us to also share the lessons that he's sharing with us to you right. all. So, it's. It's been just great. It's been great, but I think there's. Um, I yeah, the realized days, the days too when we have like a bunch of people here are the coolest days. Yeah, and we always film those. Yeah, and we for sure do get a lot done. I'm not trying to take any away from that. No, I just realized I think that there might be a misunderstanding as to what goes on behind the scenes when the cameras are off. Baron has worked his ass off f these last two years to build us this house. His dad is here every weekend. And we filmed a lot of his dad. Mm -hmm. Not enough, probably. But there's so many people that have chipped into this project. And we're so grateful for every last bit of it. I just wanted to say that it's how it, Baron is, has been killing it. it. Well, how it presents online is just different than real life. Because how it presents in videos is anytime we have like a social build day or whatever, that's what we show and that's what we film. Whereas there's a, a lot more days where it's just grind with me or both of us mm -hmm. and those days aren't interesting to show so i think there's a there's the perception of how this all went down is a little different than real life and that's probably our fault probably my fault for not filming as much when i'm just working by myself but i don't think that's very interesting i don't think there's a fault i think there's just a well that's where the mis misunderstanding, misunderstanding came from yeah so that was that was unexpected and wild, and I don't feel like I need to defend ourselves. I just wanted to. No, and it partially, partially like while we were talking about it is because that caught James off guard, and he wanted to like make it clear as to yeah how he, all this works, and maybe we'll talk about that sometime soon. But we'll definitely be having him. And man, we need to get Doreen in here too. She is she is half of their team. James is always over here, kind of teaching the structural stuff. But Doreen is equally as important as James, and she just hasn't happened to be on camera as much. It'd be so fun to have both She of does them. the hard part, like the finishing work on every project. Yes, that they do. and she keeps James straight. <laughs> yeah. she, keeps, she knows where all of his stuff is because he doesn't. Mm -hmm. She helps. They're just, an awesome team. Yeah, they're, but I think they complement each other we'll so well. We'll be seeing a lot more of Doreen as we do this finishing work and stuff because yeah. that's kind of her arena for sure they're working on a cabin right now so they've been really busy this summer too i mean they're always working on stuff mm -hmm. they're great we love them and we know that you guys love them too and we love to feature them in our videos mm -hmm. what else about the house anything oh um kind of last thing or whatever we can talk about whatever but yeah. my dad was asking me this morning if we get heat upstairs in our bedroom it's it's a little cooler up there but honestly, I love that. Yeah, we want to sleep in a cool yeah. room. But um, we'll work on ventilation, uh, like in between, so that we can open up and get more air up there if we need it, and probably have like computer fans in the vents so that they pull air. Or, I don't know. There's there's ways to solve it, but it doesn't get uncomfortably cold. Subfloor. That was something so many yeah. people asked us about for our floor in our bedroom. I think that's one of those. Uh, the, my thinking is that's one of those things that's just like here's how you do it normally and anytime you do something different than how people normally do it it kind of ruffles feathers but there are reasons for subfloors like in our in this instance the i guess the reasons that it would be useful is primarily for sound dampening 
Well, and subfloors usually beneath the subfloor is some sort of drywall for your ceiling, right? So you right. don't see the subfloor. Right. Our whole intention was so that you would see the bottom Finished of the tongue floor. groove. Yeah. That was kind of the aesthetic choice. A lot of people do that for lofts and stuff, and that's what we did. Where if you if we had subfloor, you would see the plywood below, mm -hmm. and that would just not look as good. We'd have to finish it, and we just at the, we knew that we were going to be moving into this house not quite finished, so we didn't want to have to. There's a lot of choices that we did make that we can we'll do it this way so that we can just let it be for a while and then in the future if we want to put drywall up there and add lights and stuff in like a fancy traditional way we can probably not no we're, we're probably <laughs> going to do sound you know those sound foam panel things like the waffly kind of yeah we'll probably stick some of those up or get creative with something else as we go but for now it's just you and me in here so the sound yeah, doesn't matter right. works out great and um I guess what, why else would you have subfloor? A lot of times it's for strengthening because people use like a thinner flooring, but we used really thick, like three quarter inch tongue and groove. So it's freaking sol solid. And then our, um, the spacing is pretty tight between our floor joists. So there's no give in the floor or anything. So we don't need a subfloor there. That, that caught me off guard is to like, I don't understand where the utility would be. That we're missing, but there I know has that's to be how you something. normally do it. But I don't know our thing. How we're doing this is a little different. And what is up next? Figuring out water, I think. So, um, getting the shower hooked up, like a temporary shower, so that we can figure out. Like, I want to just get it done f as like a stopgap for a while, so we see how we use the shower and what we might want to change and what might. I don't know. So we can use it and figure out how we like it and then we can build around our preferences. So I think soon we can go pick up one of those shower basin things and get that set up in here because the water heater should be here any day. I feel like once the shower is set up, that will naturally progress to the kitchen mm -hmm. sink being set up. And I think we have our we have wood planks on both of our counters kind of mimicking what the kitchen will be like we have giant wood planks that are unfinished mm -hmm. we will finish them plane them make them nice and our countertops at least for the next number of years are going to be wood because mm -hmm. that's what we can afford free because it's free <laughs> <laughs> yeah we love free um, but i don't think we're going to probably finish those until we have our appliances in until we know what sink we want until we find a fridge and an oven mm -hmm. So in the meantime, and I like, so like right now why I hooked up just a shower hose to our, uh, water pump is just so that it, it's as simple as it can be. It's just one line so that I can test, make sure the pump's working fine, make sure it's drawing out of the cistern fine uh, and make sure I don't have any leaks anywhere. Just makes it super simple. So then from here, rather than trying to like hook up everything at once, we'll probably just hook up the shower, get that set up. So then we can test how everything's draining and uh how like our water pressure like the heat all that stuff and then from there we can hook up the sink and everything in kind of an interim way just as we did the shower it's all very different than i think the way that a lot of people do it but no it's not it's normal we went normal to nomad to normal oh yeah i forgot so i'm sure everyone else when they built their houses just took up hooked up their shower and used a garden hose inside to fill up their <laughs> water filter <laughs> Right? That's how yeah, you do it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. And everybody has a giant cistern buried mm. under their foundation because no, their well is 600 yards away. No subfloors. That's normal, right? Yes. And no subfloors. <laughs> <laughs> Most important, no subfloors. I think we have some friends who are going to come out soon and we may try to do sheetrock, sheetrock the ceilings. That is a goal for when they come out this January. Something that I hadn't thought about was sheetrock because we'll, cause I've kind of always hated sheetrock because I had a little brother and it seemed like... We would just bounce into the sheetrock, and it was too fragile for us uh, growing up. But um, for the ceilings, and then for this back wall that you can kind of see through, we are thinking we'll use sheetrock to finish it because a lot of our house, if you can hear whistling, that's Pilot. All she she just if she's breathing, she's squeaking. Um, but 
the sheetrock will be like a nice contrast because we have these big beams and stuff that are kind of rough and natural looking. And then to have that really clean kind of feel that sheetrock gives, I think will be really cool. And then also something I hadn't considered until talking to our friend Gabe that works or he used to work at the, um, on earth ships down in Taos. He was saying that the sheetrock adds to your thermal battery quite a bit. And that's something I hadn't considered. Like that's just a lot of rock that will add to our cumulative thermal battery, kind of like our um, brick and everything does. Yeah, it'll be really nice. It'll look really nice too. It'll bring out these huge beams that we have. I think it'll make them look even bigger than they do now because you'll have like white to contrast them against or light color. Well. Did we quit? Is that all? I think so. I am working on some jewelry that will be launching probably in two weeks. Patrons have first access to jewelry. Thank you so much to all those people who are patrons. Yeah, you are. Uh, we appreciate you so much. Um, I still have stickers on my website, elsaray.com. If you are in need of a sticker, that's also where I sell my jewelry is my website. And then on Baron's website, normaltonomad.com, pick yourself up a book so that you can read along as we read if you would like. Because the next podcast is going to be the beginning of the audiobook. And I think it'll be really fun. Yeah, me too. And then after that, we'll probably get back into, I don't know. Every talking other, about all the things. That yeah, we just kind of catching about. up because we have a lot of things that we can't talk about in YouTube videos and stuff that we would like to talk about. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Okay. Got to go feed Miss Peel off before she throws a fit. Thank you for joining us. Oh, and if you're just listening to this, uh, it's going to be up on YouTube too. We're going to record these and put them on YouTube as well. So, yeah, you can watch them on YouTube, or if you're traveling or whatever, you can listen to them on whichever podcast app you like. Amazing. Okay, we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.